The passage and signing of the 1964 Civil Rights Act marked a sort of watershed. Certainly, it's an important piece of legislation in regard to what tack the federal government would take in regard to civil rights. Remember the last time we really had the federal government seeking to pass legislation to protect the civil rights of African Americans or other groups or ethnicities within the United States had come during Reconstruction. We'd seen sort of toothless legislation, civil rights legislation in 1957, and then the Kennedy administration had posited and sort of floated legislation, but it had not been passed by the time John F. Kennedy was assassinated in 19, late 1963. If we think about why 64, this legislation's passed, then we really have to think about a few different factors. One, of course, is the civil rights movement itself. The fact that so many protests are going on, that the public relations um, points, if you will, are beginning to stack up by the time you have the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing, by the time you have um, the events unfolding on America's TV screens in Birmingham. But on a more practical political level in Washington, in some ways it's the death of John F. Kennedy and the emergence uh, of Lyndon Johnson as president that will get this legislation passed. Remember that Johnson had risen through the ranks in Congress and along the way he had really developed a sense of the legislative machinations, the machinery that was necessary to getting legislation, getting laws pushed through Congress. And he used that knowledge very effectively as president to get a host of legislation passed, including this Civil Rights Act. But it's interesting that Kennedy had put it forward, John F. Kennedy's administration had put this legislation forward more or less but it failed to act or failed to, to bring it to fruition. Because Johnson, among other things, to get the legislation through will call up um, the spirit, the memory of John F. Kennedy, the slain president, the assassinated president. He will play upon the uh, goodwill and, and the sorrow of the United States following Kennedy's death to get civil rights legislation through. And even then, it wasn't a done deal. It wasn't um, an easy thing. That's how I should put it. But for all that the Civil Rights Act did, and remember it's geared toward public accommodation and non-discrimination in public accommodation, it doesn't end the civil rights movement. Just as Reconstruction and the legislation of Reconstruction didn't end um, the issues surrounding civil rights. Already, by the early 1960s, in fact, there's a sort of shift going on where more and more attention is being paid, particularly by SNCC and the younger generation, to the issue of voting rights. And it makes a lot of sense because how can you defend, how can you secure these rights that you now have access to, they've always been yours, but now you have access to them, how can you secure them if you don't have access to the ballot? If you're not a voter and you're, you know, you're, therefore your vote's not going to count, your voice doesn't count politically, how can you get people in office ultimately who will look out for your interests? And so, especially SNCC begins to focus in on the politics and the political issues. By 1962, uh, SNCC workers are already active in Mississippi, trying to register Mississippians to vote. They're offering legal assistance for those willing to give it a shot, and they are operating as activists, seeking to organize communities uh, to actually demand and seek um, the ballot, seek registration so that they can be in a position to vote. In, 19, in 1960, just to give you some numbers, in 1960, less than 30% of African Americans in the South um, were registered. Less than 30%. In 
And you, you already know where that comes from. You know why that is, because we've talked about uh, the, this franchisement, everything from the poll tax um, to literacy tests, which were very popular in the South, grandfather clauses, things of that nature, any tool, any mechanism that would make it difficult, to, that would create obstacles to African-American voting. Those had been largely successful, and the numbers were even lower in terms of blacks registered to vote, African-Americans registered to vote in the Deep South. Um, so you've got this huge number of people in the South who simply are not represented politically in our republic. One of my favorite quotes comes from a, a very, a relatively well-known figure that emerges by 1964. Uh, her name was Fannie Lou Hamer. And she says, and I quote, I had never heard until 1962 that black people could register to vote. I didn't know we had the right. Now, there may be a little hyperbole in that, but I think it sums up quite nicely the situation in the early 1960s in Mississippi, certainly, but more broadly, in large chunks of the southern United States. Disfranchisement had been so successful that I think many African Americans uh, never associated themselves with having this right to vote. And if they did, not because, you know, they clearly knew they could, many of them, but if, if they tried, the consequences could be extraordinarily dangerous. Uh, you, you certainly would be putting your life in jeopardy to go into a courthouse time and time again and really push the issue of registration, you and your family. Remember, it's violence, ultimately, that holds all of this control and this system of segregation and disfranchisement in place. It has since Reconstruction, just as violence held slavery in place. A good example of this violence playing out in terms of reaction uh, to efforts by SNCC workers to organize, um, organize voters in Mississippi plays out in the summer of 1964, the so-called Freedom Summer. That was a huge push. That summer of 64 was a huge push to send SNCC workers, uh, young African Americans and young whites, into Mississippi <clears throat> to push registration in advance of the 1964 presidential election. This would have been the election when Johnson stood to become president in his own right, not from the vice presidency. They go into Mississippi in 64, and it's tough, it's tough sledding. They're there to educate. They're there to collectively organize. They're there to assist black voters, demand that they be registered, and to check the legal processes. But again, the point here is violence. And June 21st and 22nd, 1964, three young men who are in Mississippi uh, to organize are killed, lynched effectively. They have been on business, uh, the business of registration. When they're pulled over, they're riding together in a car. Um, Two young white fellas and an African American, their names, by the way, uh, James Cheney, uh, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner. They're riding together in a car. They're in Neshoba County, Mississippi. They're pulled over, they're put in jail. And then, when I say they're lynched, they are released from jail really for the sole purpose of allowing individuals to stop them and kill them. And when I say individuals, I don't just mean private individuals, I mean government employees. Involved in this whole business, you have um, state troopers, but you really have uh, the Neshoba County Sheriff's Office, you have the police officers from Philadelphia, Mississippi, but you also have uh, the Mississippi White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, which has actually become a much more prominent organization in Mississippi since this whole civil rights movement has taken off. And then basically these young men are stopped and at, this is after they've already been arrested once. They're let go, they're stopped again, this time they're shot. The car's burned out and the bodies are buried uh, essentially in a dam that was uh, under construction, later to be found by the FBI. 
It's events like this that continue to propel this push for civil rights. And it's, again, it's, it's in Mississippi in 1964, but it's also on the march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama in 1965. Three marches, really. The first one ends in a tear, a tear gas bath for marchers who want, in essence, to, to demonstrate against the inability to register and to vote in Alabama. So they're going to march to Governor George Wallace's office and present you know, uh, him with their, their charges. But the first march, which um, takes place in early March of 1965, they're actually tear gassed and beaten. And then there's a second effort in which the marchers are under an injunction, and it's called Turnaround Tuesday, at which point the marchers go up to the bridge, um, but instead of trying to cross the bridge and, and getting more tear gas, they actually, oh, and also breaking this injunction, keeping them from marching, they actually kneel and pray and then turn, turn around and head back to Selma. It's not until March 25th of 1965 that they actually arrive uh, in Montgomery, Alabama to present their petitions to the governor and uh, to the legislature of Alabama. And they do so after several days of marching, about 10 miles a day. There's huge media coverage. And another thing that makes this possible, this march possible, is federal intervention. Marshals, you know, the whole nine yards called out to make sure there is no more violence. It remains an embarrassment for national politicians, but it will lead to kind of the se a second leg of this major legislative push of the 1960s, and that's the Voting Rights Act of 1965. This act provided authority for the Attorney General of the United States and the Justice Department to supervise voter registration and voting in areas where less than half of minorities eligible to vote were actually registered to vote. By 1969, the numbers had jumped from less than 30% of Southern African Americans registered to approximately two thirds. And that's just in a matter of about four years. To suggest that African Americans in the South didn't want to vote as some white reactionaries did was proven to be quite untrue. The numbers, the voting percentages would suggest otherwise once the door was open to participation by African Americans. Now this ends this specific lecture on civil rights, but it's going to continue to be a theme and it'll be in the lectures to come. But I think the big thing to take away here is there are, there are a few. One of them is how momentous this civil rights movement of the 20th century was in terms of what had happened before, in terms of reconstruction, in terms of the lynching of the late 19th century, in terms of disfranchisement and Jim Crow. But it hinges on a notion. And I, I, I want to come back to this theme very quickly. It hinges on a notion that we human beings often take for granted that things are the way they are because that's how they are, right? This assumption that culturally, culturally, it's the nature of things to be as they are. And when we do that, when we do that, we forget that our culture is something we are not only sprung from, it's not just what informs who we are, but it is also something that we create. We have a hand in creating. C. Van Woodward, a well-noted Southern historian, basically made this case writing um, on civil rights and Jim Crow and arguing that what human beings had created, i.e. the system of Jim Crow and the system of disfranchisement, human beings could tear down, undo. That's one of those notions behind the civil rights movement and a notion that goes to the heart of what this business of history is all about. An understanding that part of knowing what history is, what it's been, contains that seed that 
it can be changed. It's not set in stone, that it's still something we argue about in terms of its meaning. It's still, I, I hesitate to say it's still living, but you know what I'm saying. It's, it still has, it still has a fluidity about it. We're going to debate the meaning. We're, we're, we're going to still argue about it. It's still vibrant. I think the other thing to take away from this very simply is that, as is again often the case historically, you cannot simply talk about anything in a monolithic way. Really, it's, it's not proper, I think, to talk about the civil rights movement at all, but rather to understand that you have many individuals with varying ideas of what civil rights ought to mean, and that time changes things. That the civil rights movement itself is not one movement, but a constant evolution of ideas. As with passage of the Voting Rights Act by 1965 and the emphasis being on voting. And the civil rights movement will continue to evolve into the mid and late 1960s, concurrent with other factors that are influencing the thought, not only of African Americans, but whites and many other ethnicities uh, in the United States. So I'm going to end there and we'll pick up with the next lecture focusing on 1968 and we'll continue with some of these themes as we go. Thanks.